Our Father God, we were made to worship you. We were created to bring you praise. And so, Father, we ask that you take our offering now, our time of worship, that we know that you hear us. And we're so thankful for your unconditional love, regardless of what kind of shape we're in. So, Lord, we lay aside the concerns, the burdens, knowing that you are our great Redeemer, our loving Savior. We have so much to thank you for, so many reasons to be thankful. So we worship you, Lord, and we lift your holy name.
we can reflect, Father, on where we were a year ago now. And all that you've brought us through. And Lord, I know that for many of us, that our hearts were aching and we were longing to be together in the same building, in the same room with one another, just missing the communion of the saints, the, the body of believers, to be able to join together and truly worship you. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you never left us, you never forsaked us, even when we were isolated. And all the more now, we get the chance to be reunited, to lift our voices, to praise you, to glorify you, with the thankfulness of what you've brought us through and knowing with confidence that you will carry us, you will sustain us, regardless of what the future holds. You are true. You are faithful. You are unfailing. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your grace.
grace like rain falling down on me. Hallelujah, all my stains are washed away. We can pray for the Barnes family because this week Tim was exposed. And I don't mean, well, never mind. <laughs> I don't think I have to clarify. We all know Tim. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Um, but we've got Joel back. And the whole family. And Joel, you, you don't know this, but we're abbreviating these services. We're not doing greeting time. Like, uh, we greet like this. That's, this is greeting time now, yeah. We're social distancing for the sake of those in the internet audience. So you can come up anytime you want. Even if you don't want, I think you have to come now. <laughs> <laughs> Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Dear Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to come to the house of the Lord and be with the saints. And we get to praise you. And Lord, as we come to, come to your word and just, I pray that you would work in our lives and, and open our hearts and our minds, open our eyes, pray that we would be used by you to be a light to the world. And I pray that the, the scripture would, would encourage us to do that. Pray that you would use what I have to say to, to help us to, to go out and be fearless with, with the people that are around us to share the gospel. And Lord, as we know that is the, the day that we remember you came in with the triumphal entry, how fearless you were to go to the cross. And Lord, there was a, a lot of difficulty in that. Lord, you've cried out. You cried out to your father, knowing that it was, a, it was going to be a difficult thing. But Lord, you, you walked into Jerusalem where your fate would be decided on, that you would go to that cross. And, and, and you did that fearless. You did it triumphantly. So Lord, let us walk in the same manner, knowing that what, what, whatever might come our way, that we can rest assured in you. And we pray, Lord, that you, would, um, that you would help us in that way, especially as we look to you this day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The scripture reading comes this morning out of Mark chapter 11, 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and it will be sent back shortly. They went and found the colt outside in the street at the doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? And they answered, Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. And when they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it, and he sat on it. 
And many people spread their cloaks on the road, and while others spread branches, they had cut in the, in the fields, and those who went ahead of them, and those who followed them, shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming king of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. This is the word of the Lord. Expectations. The people of, I, I, these were Jesus' followers who were shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, Hosanna. They had great expectations of who Jesus was to them. But we know what is to follow. Jesus had a mission, and his mission was to get to the cross. He sent his, his face like flint to the cross, the Bible tells us, and he wanted to get there. First, he had to come into Jerusalem, and had, he had a whole bunch of people with him, and they were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They recognized who Jesus was. Their eyes have been opened for just a moment. They recognize this could be. No, they recognized that this was the coming king, that this was the, their coming Messiah. Their eyes were opened, yet we know that just five days later, these same people who were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, would be shouting, crucify him. Why is that? Why is it that a crowd on Sunday could be shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the coming king of our, our father David, recognizing that he is the Messiah on, Mon on Sunday, but on Friday be shouting, crucify him. And if you look at the, the Gospel of Mark, the answer becomes evidently clear that it is a matter of faith. That, it, that their faith had been in something other than Jesus. Yes, they had faith that he was the Messiah, but their faith was in their expectations of who Jesus was. And I want to note that there's a huge difference between having faith in Jesus and having faith in an expectation of Jesus. And this is a, a scary thing to realize when we are, uh, when we are considering our own faith. Do we, who do we have faith in? Do we have faith in Jesus? Do we have faith in God? Or do we have a faith in an expectation of who Jesus is? If you read through the book of Mark, you'll see that Jesus teaches a lot on faith. And a lot of the, the confrontations that Jesus has with people is a matter of faith. Or do you believe? And Jesus asked that time and time again, do you believe? Jesus was amazed at the faith of a Gentile woman. Jesus questioned the Pharisees on a matter of their faith, not in a matter of their practice. Jesus wasn't going after the Pharisees because they were obeying Sabbath. He wasn't going after them merely because of their traditions. All of us have traditions of one sort or another. But where do they place their faith? From, the, from chapter one of Mark to chapter eight, we see that Jesus spends a lot of time discussing faith. And again, I wanna bring us back to the Pharisees for a moment. Jesus is often critical of the Pharisees, but it's because of their, their lack of faith. They had their expectations. If I follow the law, then God will bless me. If I follow these traditions, God will bless me. They had faith in God, but it was faith that was based upon their expectations of what God should do. And then when we get to Mark chapter eight, Jesus starts to ask his followers, who do people say that I am? 
And you remember Peter's reply. He said, some say that you were John the, uh, John the Baptist. Others say that you were one of the prophets. And Jesus asks him, but who do you say that I am? It's something that gets down to the personal level. Who do you say that Jesus is? He is the Messiah, or is he some picture of who you think he is? Peter recognized that he was the Messiah. He said, you are the Messiah. And and Jesus said, don't tell anyone. Because there was a, at this point, up before this point, there was a messianic secret, if you will. Jesus kept who he was a secret. Every time that he would perform a miracle in the book of Mark, he would say to the Jewish people, don't tell anyone. Of of course, we know how that worked out. They told everyone. But Jesus was not ready to yet reveal who he was. That wouldn't be revealed, and Jesus wasn't ready to reveal that until his triumphal entry. And there, he revealed it, and he accepted the role of Messiah amongst the crowds. Who do you say that Jesus is? But before, before Jesus asks Peter, who do people say that I am? There was an event in Mark chapter eight, Mark chapter eight verses 22 through 26. And there Jesus meets a blind man and he first touches his eyes and the man cannot see. I mean, it's blurry. He can see, but it's, it's, it's blurry. And then after that, Jesus begins to heal him again and he sees everything clear. I think this is an emblematic healing at this, at this point. It's something that teaches something about us, that we could see something, that when Jesus comes into your life, you can see a little bit. But unless we accept Jesus full he- for full healing, we are going to be seeing dimly. This is what happened with Peter. Peter saw Jesus for who he was. He was the Messiah. But then Jesus said to him that he must die in Mark chapter eight. And at that point, Peter rebuked Jesus for even the thought that Jesus might die. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. See, Peter recognized who Jesus was. But it was an expectation of who Jesus was and what he would do. There's a passage that Jesus speaks. I'm gonna read it. It comes from Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, and Jesus says very clearly that that whoever whoever wants to be my disciple must must lose their life. Whoever wants to be my disciple will pick up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to lose their, whoever wants to gain life, whoever wants to seek life, will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel, they will find life. See, Jesus, this this passage right here that comes out of Mark chapter 8 is very important. This is the linchpin of the entire gospel of Mark. Because before, as I said, prior to Mark chapter 8, Jesus talks about faith so much. Faith is important. You must have faith. And he gives examples of how you must have faith. But now, after Mark chapter 8, Jesus begins to push to a further level. You must be willing to give up your life. And when Jesus (laughs) speaks about this, this kind of faith, if you think about it, when you're trying to gain life for yourself, who are, you, who are you trusting when you're trying to gain life for yourself? 
yourself. You're trusting in yourself. But when you have to lay down your life in order to receive life, who, do you have to, who, are, who, who would you have to trust then? You'd have to trust in God because it's no longer a work that you have to do. It's no longer an expectation of I must do this and this and this to, to receive life. No, our faith in Jesus Christ becomes the thing that gives us life. We must trust him. We must trust him for, for life. And what we find is that with every passing moment, after Mark chapter eight till we receive, all the way up to where we get to Mark chapter 11, Jesus is teaching on this very point. And he says this to his disciples. Remember, there was a point in Mark chapter nine where his disciples have been going out and trying to free people from free this man from a demonic oppression. And they were arguing amongst themselves, saying, we can't do it. We can't do it. And Jesus walks into, their, into the midst, and he looks squarely at them at this moment in time, and he rebukes them. He rebukes them. Them, uh, the follow, he re- rebukes his own follow, followers for their lack of faith. If we go to Mark, we can see that. Jesus says this. I'm going to have to get my, uh, my page. Here we go. Mark chapter 9, verses 19. He says, You unbelieving generation... Mark chapter nine, verse 19. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. See, in this moment, his disciples were out there trying to perform this exorcism of this boy, and they were unsuccessful. You know what? Just like the Pharisees had done before, they were putting their, their faith and trust in their works. So too, the disciples of Jesus were doing what Jesus told them to do. Earlier in Mark, Jesus sends out his disciples to, and he gives them the authority to cast out demons. Yet, with this demon, they're having a diff- great difficulty with and they're unable to do it. There's something that was missing, and that was with faith. In the, in the presence of the, of the Pharisees, Jesus rebukes his own disciples and says, you unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? In other versions, it says, you unbelieving and adulterous generation. And this is of Jesus' own disciples, Jesus says plainly to them later on, he said, this kind, type of demon, this type of spirit only comes out with, fair, with, with prayer and fasting. See, when we are praying and we are fasting, we are putting aside the things of this world for the things of God. We are putting away the things that you know, I can do it because I have been given the authority. You know, the trust in yourself, the trust in your own works, the trust in your own abilities. And you're putting that aside and you're saying, it's in the authority of God. I can do it by God, by faith, by faith in God. It's important. Because we find that Jesus is now pressing his own disciples on the same thing that we find his dis- uh, that he was pressing the the Pharisees on. You know, it's a lot easier to pick on the Pharisees. You know, it's a lot easier to pick on those who are other than ourselves. But when we realize, hey, I struggle with the same thing, just on a different on a, on a different point. You know. You know, the Pharisees were putting their trust in the law, okay? The fair, and, and while the followers of Jesus were putting trust in the words of Jesus, but 
from a point of their own expectations, from a point where they themselves felt like I can do it on my own. I'm going to be obedient to Jesus. I'm gonna do everything that Jesus tells me I should do, but they're not doing it from an act of faith, but as an act of what they can do on their own. And this is what happened with the disciples of Jesus. They were casting out demons, but they were doing it by their own expectation by, of themselves. And Jesus calls them out for it. He says, you unbelieving and adulterous generation in the presence of the Pharisees for whom Jesus was also harsh upon. They missed it. They missed the reality that they must place their, who they must place their faith in. It's a lot, it's very easy sometimes to do the work of, of a Christian. You know, love my brother. Oh, it's really hard to do that sometimes. Love, you know, love those who are around me. Um, you know, bring in uh, my, you know, spend time in the church, try to, you know, help out and do things around, you know, Christ, good Christianly things. But when we start to make those things what we're about, then we've missed it. It's like Mary and Martha, for example. How Martha was busy doing good work. She was preparing for Jesus, but Mary, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and she did, chose the better. She chose the better because she had faith in Jesus and it was allowing Jesus to do the work. It's important that we don't get so wrapped up in doing that we miss the work that God is doing and has done. Back to Mark chapter 11. We find that the people of Israel, or the followers of Jesus, began to recognize that this is the king who is coming. You know, we sign that, that as they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage. And Beth Page was the place where Jesus performed the miracle of the healing of the blind. And so people who were in that community would have known that man, would have known the blind man who was touched by Jesus. They would have recognized that. It also says that he went into Bethany on his way. And if you remember, Bethany is where Lazarus lived. And remember the miracle that Jesus had called forth Lazarus from the tomb, and he lived. So we find that Jesus ministered in these places and performed great miracles. He would have had a great following in these places. And so Jesus, as he's moving to Jerusalem, would have been traveling with his followers, but also people who would have known Jesus' work. They had a great expectation of him. And at this point, there, was a mes there were messianic prophecies that Jesus was fulfilling and they recognized him. Matthew chapter 11, verse five says this. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is proclaimed to the poor. This was the, their expectation of the Messiah, that he would come, and he's fulfilling all of the messianic prophecies, and he's recognized for it. He's recognized for it. And in this moment, Jesus caps off the messianic prophecies with Zechariah, that comes from Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly, daughters of Zion. Shout, daughters of Jerusalem, See, the king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, riding on a donkey, a colt, a foal of a donkey. And we find that Jesus, in this moment, allows the messianic, prophecy, or messianic secret to be revealed. And he fully embraces it by taking this donkey and riding upon it into Jerusalem. It would have been a sign for those who were around him, his followers, those who were going through Beth Page and, and recognizing who Jesus was, those who saw, um, who spoke to Lazarus and knew that he was around and that he was alive and that Jesus was risen from the dead. All these people were excited about Jesus. 
Have you ever been so excited about something before in your, whole, you know, in your life? And you go, I, you have a great expectation of something. Yeah, these, these people were, had, had been in bondage for so long. They had been in bondage from the time of the Babylonians and here their Messiah was coming and they had great expectations that, the, that Jesus would come into Jerusalem and release them from their oppress, oppressors. Great expectations of who Jesus was. And we find that Jesus allows them to recognize who he was. Just like that blind man where he healed in two parts where he was, where the blind man first was able to see but it was blurry and then Jesus healed the man completely and he could see clearly. Well, the followers of Jesus were still viewing him blurry, as if blurry. He, they recognized that he was the Messiah but they didn't have the full picture. He allowed them to have their expectations of who he was but he wouldn't meet their expectations. What can, and I asked this already, what can make a crowd go on Sunday being excited about Jesus and then on Friday yell, crucify him? It's the lack of faith. These people, Out of all the people in the, mentioned in the gospel, these ones are the ones that scare me the most. <laughs> and that's because they recognized that Jesus was their Messiah. These people were shouting, Hosanna, which is, please save me. They were shouting to Jesus, save me. They recognized who Jesus was. They knew that he was their Messiah. They were shouting scripture at him. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which comes out of the Psalms. Blessed is the, ki- is the king of, uh, coming king of our father David, the, pro- the, the messianic prophecy. They recognized who Jesus was and yet they missed it. They were speaking scripture over him. They were shouting, save me, but they missed it. And that scares me. Go with our own faith for a moment. That we can be in church and we can be crying out to God, Lord, save me. We can be praying scripture and reading scripture over our lives and, and recognizing um, that God brings salvation and yet miss it. Out of all the people in the Bible, I or in the Gospels, these are the ones that, that scare me the most. So it causes me to think deeply about my own faith. Do I have faith in Jesus? Or do I have faith in an expectation of, of Jesus? I think that makes a world of difference. 2020 was a crazy year, and 2021 has <laughs> been pretty crazy as well. And there are a lot of things that we might have expectations for. Well, if if I expect, you know, there might be some people who say, well, I place my trust in Jesus, but now this difficulty comes into my life, and I go, why did that happen, God? Why did you allow me to have that? And then the crisis of faith begins, or it can begin. God, why did you allow the death of my family member? Why did you allow these financial difficulties to come into my life? I've been following you. I've been doing what I was supposed to do. Haven't I been a good Christian? I, I've been loving my, my, my brothers and sisters in the Lord. I've been, I've been taking care of, I've been, I've been following your commands to love those even who I don't like? What is going on? See, it's so easy to build into our lives this expectation of what should happen to us because we're a follower of Jesus. And I think that a lot of times when we see people following away from the faith, 
it's that there's a failed expectation of who Jesus was to them rather than of who Jesus actually is. So yes, these these people scare me. (laughs) Because am I like them? Am I like them? And if I'm going to be honest with myself, yeah, at times I have an expectation of of what I believe God should do in my life. But I need to give that up over to Christ and allow him to work and be who he said that he is, not who I say that he is. If we look to the life of Paul, Paul had a lot going for him. Paul could have remained and stayed a Pharisee of Pharisees, but he gives that all up and he counts it as loss. So much so that we find that he is in prison for the very things that he is preaching and that he is teaching. He goes on with a huge list, and I don't have it here with me this morning, but he talks about how he's been beaten how he's been imprisoned, how he's been shipwrecked, how he's, his, faith, his, fa- his health had been failing, how, how many things went wrong because he chose to follow Christ. Those things that are going wrong in, our, in, our, in, our, in his life or from the outside, people say, why are you doing that? You're a follower of God and, and yet all these difficulties come into your life? Yes. And when he speaks to the Philippians, and this is a prison epistle, and he was writing this from prison. He says this to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 4, 10 through 13. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. The things that come into our lives, the difficulties that we might experience in our lives, are not as a result of failing to be a good Christian or, or God in Christ failing to give you the things that you think you should be given. God gives us strength in whatever situation and whatever circumstance that we find ourselves in. And this is an important thing because if we chase the things or the blessings, you know, the material blessings, and we say, we're following after God, I'm, I'm giving, you know, financially, I'm giving of my time, you know, I should receive blessings, then we're in danger of missing it. There's something greater than just the physical blessings, and that is the spiritual blessings that God has given to us in Christ. He's learned the secret of being content, Paul says, the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Now, if these people who are praising Jesus on Sunday saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, had realized what, had, what was going on. I don't believe that they would have had, uh, they would have been crying out, crucify him, just five days later. They would have recognized that Jesus' life is in the hands of his Father, the one that he's been speaking of time and time again. Jesus went to the cross, and he lived a righteous life. Difficulty came into his life. Difficulty came into the life of Paul, who is doing everything right. Difficulty will come into our lives, who are doing everything right. But when those difficulties come, are you going to choose to run and to flee from the thing that Christ was offering, the things that God is offering? Or are we going to accept the things that God is offering? 
It's very easy to say, God, where are you in this moment? You know, I, I'm going through this trial. Where have you been? If, I, if you were here, it wouldn't have happened. It's very easy to say that and to reject what God is giving up to us in those moments. And that is contentment and peace that is only found in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, Paul continues to talk about his contentment in the Lord, even in the midst of struggle. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest on me. Where are you this morning? Is your faith in an expectation of Jesus? Are you singing, save me, Lord? You know, blessed are you. Are we singing these things of Jesus? Yet an expectation of Jesus, or are we placing our faith and trust in who he is and who he said he was? There's a big difference and we need to know those differences, and we need to be able to place the things, our expectations aside in light of what he is doing and what he is giving us. Don't reject Christ, the good things that Christ has given us, because it doesn't meet our expectation of what we should get. The people, of, uh, the people who are lined up praising him in the streets, they were doing just that. So I encourage you this morning Okay? Christ has given us so much. Take hold of those things. There's so much to be worried about. I don't have to list them out for you. <laughs> you know your situations. But don't let get bogged down by what you expect what you should be expect uh, what you should expect. But hold on to the promises of God that he is sufficient for you and that he will see you through. There's a great reward that's coming for us. The book of Revelation speaks about the new heavens and the new earth. Yeah, the, the trials are gonna be difficult for us here. Jesus warns us of the, the trials that we'll all face there's a great reward that's coming for us. Place your trust in him, knowing that today's gonna be difficult and can be difficult, but we know that he has conquered the world and we need to place our trust in him, not in expectation. Would you bow with me in prayer? Dear Lord, we come before you and we recognize, we recognize that we can't do it on our own. We recognize that our expectations are flawed. Just like the people who are praising you one on, on Sunday, as you came in and you revealed who you were as their Messiah, but five days later gave them, uh, were giving them up and calling out, crucify, crucify. They had a failed expectation of who you were. They didn't miss who you were. They, they recognized that you were the Messiah, but they didn't want what you came to give us, and that was eternal life in you. So, Lord, I, I pray that if those are in this room or are watching on the Internet, that if they have never placed their trust in you, that they would do so. That they would recognize that you are the King of kings, the Lord of Lords that you came for a specific reason that you would that they would bring and that you would bring them out of their sin Lord that's a beautiful thing 
not come to release them from the Romans, Roman occupation. You came to release them from an even greater sin, or an even greater enemy, being sin. Lord, we pray that if there's anyone out there that would long to be released from their sin and from the things that the trials of this world that that they would give their lives over to you who has conquered all and Lord we also pray for those believers who shout praise to your name who would be amongst those who would cry out you know Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Who full faith that you are the Messiah. Would you give us strength to put away our expectations of who you are. For who you actually are. That when life gets difficult, when trials arise in our lives, that we wouldn't back away and reject what you are giving us which is to be sustained through our trials but that you would do a work in our lives that we would press in to you in those trials to be content in whatever circumstance Lord thank you for examples that we find in your word from Christ to Paul who went through great trials and difficulties but they knew the secret of being content in every situation Lord let us let us lean in to you thank you Lord for the opportunity that I have come been able to to come and to give give and share your word we pray that you would cause us to go out and to live lives of faith into our communities, to all around, um, in, in our families, and wherever we might go. And pray all these things, Lord. In your name, amen. It's a good word. Um. We watch this at play in America, like there's, um, it, it's important to know our Bibles, to know what God says, to know what God thinks. That's our opportunity to know what God thinks, right? And Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. But there's this gospel in America that if you believe in Jesus, you're going to be prosperous. If, you're gonna, if you believe in Jesus, you're going to prosper which eventually is going to be true. You know, I mean, that's our destination. But, but the people that buy this, when trouble comes, it, it sinks them. You know? I, I've watched it happen. I'm old enough that I've watched it happen. It sinks them. Trouble comes, and they're going, this gospel thing doesn't work. Well, no, Jesus said, in this life you'll have trouble. You know? And where the, the, the folks that were crying, the folks that were crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I think that they were disappointed on the first day because it's clear that they were expecting a a conqueror of Rome. And Jesus came to conquer sin, not Rome. So when he comes into Jerusalem, he makes a left instead of a right. Instead of turning over the tax tables, he goes into his father's house and sets his father's house straight. And I think that he lost a lot of folks right there because their expectation wasn't rooted in God's word, you know? So, uh, you know, dig in, folks. <laughs> Let's just know it. <laughs> you know, and, and, and really be teachable because, boy, you think you know something.
guide us. We ask that you make us wise. We ask that you would fill us, fill us with your spirit as you promised. I pray that that would somehow change us from who we are naturally to somebody that you can use. Lord, I pray that we would infect our neighborhoods. I pray that we would infect our families. I pray that we would infect our workplace. Um, we believe that you are the, the gospel is the power of God to transform a person's soul so that we can come home so that we can be redeemed so that we can be transformed into your image um, we've watched you doing this in our lives and we ask that you would continue to do it Lord we pray that you would complete the work that you started like you promised and, and uh, we love you in Jesus name we pray amen Cause you his own made in his image you were made for more you think there is no plan that it's all by chance but don't 